بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Alright, this is the second session uh, on uh, basic introduction to fiqh. Uh, last time we went over uh, some definitions. Uh, does anybody remember the uh, linguistic definition of fiqh? The word fiqh. What does it linguistically mean? Understanding. All right, understanding. And the <coughs> technical definition. Technical definition of fiqh. Anybody ha- want to summarize it? It was a bit technical, but yeah. Right. Good. Right. So knowledge of the of the the rulings of the re- revealed law. All right. Knowledge of the rulings of the revealed law. <clears throat> and then we also talked about the connection between uh, fiqh and aqidah. All right. We mentioned a number of examples of uh, rulings. When Allah explains the rulings or He commands the rulings, He says, do this or stay away from this. He also brings in aqidah with it. Anybody have an example of that? Of uh, Allah commanding something and then at the same time connecting it to our belief. Anybody have an example of that? No examples? Yeah. Uh, the right, exactly. So what's the, how, how is that? Good. And the beginning of the verse, how does it begin? Right. So it addresses those who believe. Right? That just addresses those who believe. <clears throat> uh, we give a few other examples. All right. So uh, let's get started, inshallah, on uh, what we're going to go on and <clears throat> discuss today. Uh, Islamic fiqh comprises everything that mankind needs. Right? The, the beauty of uh, Islamic fiqh is that it uh, involves all aspects of our life. Right, every single aspect of our, of our life. And uh, there is um, a hadith in which the, the, the pagan Arabs, the mushrikun, the, the disbelievers of Mecca, they were trying to um, uh, make fun of the Prophet Wasallam, And they came to Salman al-Farisi and they said, your Prophet, he, you know, he teaches you everything, even how to use the bathroom. Right? Your, your Prophet teaches you everything, even how to use the bathroom. And Salman responded, yes, this is actually a source of pride for us, that our religion teaches us everything, even going to the bathroom. It has guidance for every single facet of life. So the religion does not just tell us how to behave on Sunday or on Saturday or Friday alone. Right? What good is a religion that tells you what to do on Sunday, but the rest of the week it tells you you're on your own. Figure it out on your own. The beauty of Islam is that it has... Rulings for every aspect of life, 24-7. All right? And this is the beauty of Islam. Uh, Islamic fiqh deals with all aspects uh, of our life. All aspects of our life. So when we study fiqh, what are we actually studying? Uh, the scholars have categorized uh, the, the fields of, of fiqh, the subcategories of fiqh. And there are seven groups, or seven categories, or subfields of fiqh. The first are the rulings that are connected to worship. The rulings that are connected to worship, such as salah uh, and zakah, hajj, and any other act of worship. And what are these called? Anyone? When you study these, these are called what? Anyone? Uh, ibadat. All right. So ibadat. This is the field that deals with worship. Right. The, the, the deals with worship. Uh, how we worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. These are called ibadat, and this is the most important aspect of fiqh. All right, because this is the, the, the type of fiqh that deals, everyone deals with. Everyone is connected with. All right, and then you have the, the second group. These are the rulings that are connected to the family. All right, marriage, divorce, uh, financial support, inheritance. And in Arabic we call this al-ahwal al-shakhsiya. Al-ahwal al-shakhsiya, or sometimes people call it fiqh al-usra, the fiqh of the family. All right, so this is the second category of, uh, subcategory of fiqh. Uh, dealing with the family, marriage, divorce, lineage, financial support, inheritance, and so on. Uh, the third group, these are uh, rulings that are connected to actions of people and transactions with each other. Buying, selling, renting, uh, lawsuits, judicial decisions. And these are called in Arabic, mu'amalat. Mu'amalat. All right? So if you pick up any book of fiqh, it's gonna, you're going to have these sections. Right? You have the ibadat, starting with the ibadat. Uh, and it won't necessarily be in this order. 
but they will cover these uh, chapters or these subcategories of fiqh. All right, the third group is mu'amalat. The fourth group, uh, the fourth group are rulings connected to the duties of the ruler, all right, such as establishing justice, warding off injustice, implementing rulings, all right, anything, that the, anything that is the duty of the ruler, the Islamic ruler, then there's a separate category of fiqh uh, just for these types of rulings. And these are called in Arabic al-ahkam al-sultaniya. Al-ahkam al-sultaniya or al-siyasa al-shari'iya. Al-siyasa al-shari'iya. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Parliamentary? No. This is Islamic governments. Right? This is Islamic governments. Uh, not necessarily, but it's Islam, Islamic government. Islamic government. Uh, the, the fifth group are rulings con- connected to punishment, maintaining security, order, all right? such as the punishment for a person who murders, punishment for the one who steals, the, the drinker of alcohol. And these are called al uqubat al uqubat right, Then we have the sixth group. These are... Uh, rulings re- re- related to the relationships between an Islamic country and other countries. All right, so this is kind of similar to the rulings uh, of the, the the ruler, but this is more relationship between countries. All right, so rulings regarding war and peace. Can we have treaties with a non-Muslim country? If you, if you can have a treaty, how long should that treaty last, and so on? All right, the rulings of uh, between countries, war and peace, and taking uh, taxes, and so on. And these are called, this is called in Arabic, as seer And the seventh group are, these are rulings connected to matters in the Quran, good and evil deeds, uh, qualities, and these are called in Arabic, al-adab or al-akhlaq. All right, so uh, these seven categories, they cover all aspects of life. So every aspect of our life has an Islamic ruling, and it will fall under one of these categories. It will fall under one of these categories. Now, if we compare uh, Islamic fiqh to man-made fiqh or man-made legislation, we'll see that there are a number of differences. So we have, on one hand, uh, divine legislation, divine legislation, and on the other hand, we have man-made legislation. And if we compare the two, well, we will see that there are uh, a number of differences. Uh, I'll pull up something, inshallah, to uh, illustrate the differences between the two. Yeah, I'm going to uh, share something else. Uh. All right, so if we compare, we'll compare the two, right? Divine legislation versus man-made legislation. Uh, divine legislation on the left side, man-made legislation on the right side. Uh, the first is the source of legislation. What is the source of legislation when it comes to divine legislation? What is the source? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The revelation, right? We can say revelation, al-wahi. So it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it cannot, be, it cannot have any mistakes, right? It cannot uh, be a sub- subject to any errors, right? Because it's, if it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, as for man-made legisla- legislation, it's from human beings, right? Human beings are the ones coming up with it, and human beings are subject to errors, they are subject to mistakes, and so the man-made legislation uh, is subject to errors, and is subject to shortcomings. All right, Applica- uh, applicability, all right, uh, applying the legislation, applying legislation. So divine legislation, we say it is for all times and all places. So the rulings that we have, all right, these rulings that we have, it was good at the time of Rasulullah and it is good now, and it will always be, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, we are always able to apply it in the future as well, in all times and all places. No matter where we are, all right, no matter what country you're in, these rulings, these uh, divine rulings are applicable for all times and places. All right, as for man-made legislation, then the application is limited, right? And what may be uh, okay or might be applicable in one country, it might not be applicable in a different country, or it might be uh, applicable in one time and in another time, another time, another, another era, another decade, these laws are no longer uh, 
applicable. All right, reward and punishment. Uh, in, in divine legislation, there is both reward and punishment. Right? There's reward and punishment, meaning if you do good, you are rewarded. All right? That reward, it can come in this life, but the main reward is coming in the next life. Right? As for man-made legislation, there's only punishment. All right? There's only punishment. The, the, the law, following the law doesn't, doesn't get you anything. Right? If you follow the law, you don't, they, don't give you, um, you know, they don't give you extra money or anything like that. In fact, they take money from you, right? They take taxes from you. So if you follow the law and you, you, know, you do everything you're supposed to do as a citizen, all right, as an uh, honorary citizen, you won't get rewarded for it, right? As for divine legislation, if you follow Allah's commandments and you stay away from the prohibitions, then you are rewarded for it, right? You can re receive the reward in this life, but the main reward will come in the next life. And there's also punishment. If you don't uh, follow Allah's orders and you don't stay away from His, uh, his, his uh, prohibitions, then there is, you are subject to punishment. Maybe in this life, and if not in this life, then in the next life. All right, but man-made legislation, it only deals with punishment. If you break the law, then you are subject to punishment, imprisonment, and whatever, fine, or whatever. But if you follow the law, then there is no reward in system in place. All right, the punishment type. In divine legislation, the punishment can come in this life, and it come in the next as well. All right, so if a person happens to get away with something in this life, all right, they can't get away with it in the next life. All right, if somebody murders, and they, they murder in such a way that there is no way somebody is able to find any trace, all right, they covered their tracks completely, they can get away with it right, in this life, but they can't get away with it in the next life. So the punishment can be in this life. The punishment can also be in the next life as well. All right, man-made legislation, the punishment only is in this life. All right, there's no... Uh, possibility of punishment in the next life according to man-made legislation. All right, the goal <clears throat> for divine legislation, uh, there's two main goals. The relationship between an individual and his creator and the relationship between an individual and his society. All right, in man-made legislation, it only governs the relationship between individual and society only. But it does not have anything to do with your relationship between yourself and your creator. All right, justice. Divine legislation, there's absolute justice. Meaning that whatever a person does, right, good or bad, they will see the fruits of that. Right? They will, it will either be punishment or reward. Uh, as for man-made legislation, the, the justice is limited. We find all the time right, that it's very possible that a criminal can get off. Right? This happens all the time. A criminal can uh, commit a crime Right? What, I mean, what are some famous examples of that? All right, the guy who, who passed away, um, who died a few weeks ago, had a very famous case in the 90s. Yeah, the, football the football player, who, who's that? O.J. Simpson, right? Everybody knows that he, he committed the murder, right? I mean, this is like a common knowledge that he, he murdered his wife, right? Uh, but he got off with it because he had a very good lawyer. He had a very good lawyer, and so uh, justice was not served. All right, justice was not served. Uh, and this is possible in man-made legislation, right? Or somebody can go to prison for a crime they never committed, right? That, that happens, right? Somebody could go to prison and they never committed the crime. This happens all the time, uh, 30, 30, 40 years later, and they found out, well, the DNA, the, 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 the DNA does not match. And this person was innocent all the time. Uh, so this can happen in man-made legislation. In divine legislation, the, per the justice is perfect because even if the justice is not served in this life, it will be served in the next life. All right, fleeing from punishment. Uh, uh, also, uh, we, we mentioned this earlier as well, that uh, in the divine legislation, a criminal can never get away. You can never get away. All right, because if you get away in this life, you're definitely not going to get away in the next life. You can get away in this life, but you will not get away in the next life. As for man-made legislation, then the criminal can get away. All right, and we see this all the time. Uh, if you have uh, money, if you have connections, then the criminal is able to get away, all right? Or, or they can just flee, go to a different country, you know, disguise themselves, and the criminal can get away. Uh, that, that's very possible in man-made leg legislation. All right, nature of the punishment. In divine legislation, the punishment fits the crime. And this is what we believe as Muslims, that whatever punishments Allah has given, whether that's the punishment for murder, or it's the punishment for adultery, or it's the punishment for theft, 
The punishment fits the crime. The, punish, the punishment fits the crime. The punishment is equal to the crime, equal to the severity of the crime. Uh, as for man-made legislation, the punishment may not fit the crime. Sometimes we find that uh, a person, they commit murder, they murder somebody else, and they, they go into prison for five, ten years, they, you know, they come out, they, they, uh, they, they behave well in prison, they, and they can get uh, parole, and they come out, and they come out, right? Uh, sometimes a person can do something not as major, and they go into prison for 30, 40 years, 50 years, right? And we, we see this all the time, especially, uh, it, it happens as well, it might be um, it, it might be different for different uh, categories of people, right? So certain races of people might be more exposed to punishment uh, as opposed to certain races. And we see this all the time, right? Um, anybody who's studied you know the civil rights movement knows that this this these kind of things happen, where people from a certain background they face some more severe punish, punishments than others. So the nature of the punishment, for a divine legislation, the punishment will always fit the crime. For a man-made legislation, punishment may not fit the crime. You might, uh, a person might uh, be punished more than they deserve, or they might be punished less than they deserve in man-made legislation. All right, the nature of the le legislation, uh, divine legislation focuses on actions of the body and actions of the heart. As for a man-made legislation, only focuses on actions of the body. Right, so in, man, in divine legislation, we, you know, a, a huge part of it is fixing your heart, right? fixing, fixing yourself, uh, removing the diseases of the heart. Right? Man-made legislation has nothing to do with that. They don't care about uh, anything of the, the disease, disease of the heart. Right? There's no legislation that says that you can't be envious. Right? In, in, in Islam, envy is a sin. Right? You, you are sinful if you are envy, if you have envy, or if you're an envious person. In man-made legislation, right, U.S. law, is there any punishment for a person who's envious? Right? No, they, there's, there's no way of them even knowing what's in your heart to begin with. Right? So uh, the divine legislation focuses on body, but also focuses on the heart. So the rulings related to the inner, inside and outside, right? such as these diseases of the heart, envy, uh, slander, and so on. And then uh, the, the man-made legislation only focuses on actions of the body. All right, pardoning from punishment. Uh, in divine legislation, with repentance, you can receive pardon from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you disobey, if you commit, commit an act of disobedience, you can get pardoned, right? If you repent sincerely, then we believe that you can, uh, it's as if, right? the one who uh, repents from a sin is like the one who has no sin to begin with, right? This can happen in divine law. Although there are, of course, certain, certain exceptions, if there is a, uh, if a person does a crime between human beings, right, you, you wrong somebody else, then you have to seek pardon from that person. Right? Uh, so it's not as easy when it comes to uh, punishments or, or crimes that deal with between fellow human beings. But if a person does a, uh, a sin and it's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you repent, then Allah will remove that sin. All right, as for man-made legislation, there's no, there's no pardon uh, with repentance. All right, that somebody committed a crime or they did something wrong, and they, you know, they, they, they repent, it won't be accepted, right? They, they still have to go through the justice system, and they might have to face the, uh, the, the, the prison time or where, wherever the, the, uh, the justice system car carries out. All right, so these are uh, the main differences between divine legislation and man-made legislation. As we see, the divine legislation is, of course, superior because it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, Allah ya'lamu man khalaq. Does not the one who creates, he knows. He created us, he knows. Right? He knows what is good for us, he knows what is bad for us, he knows uh, all of the things that make the society function, what destroys the society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all this, he created us. And the rules of Islamic fiqh, they reflect that. The rules of Islamic fiqh re reflect that. <clears throat> All right, back to uh, the book, inshallah. All right, next thing we're going to move to is uh, afterwards uh, a, key, a key element of Islamic law or Islamic fiqh is that uh, it is based on concept of ease. Ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, 
Allah has not made in uh, any difficult for difficulty for you in the religion. Allah has not made any difficulty for you in the religion. Meaning that all of the Islamic legislation, all of the rules, all, right, all of the rules, they are within the capability of a normal human being. All, right? all, all, all of Allah's commands, all of Allah's prohibitions, they are all within our capability. Allah does not command us something that we are not capable of doing. Or Allah does not prohibit us from something that we are not capable of staying away from. All of the, uh, all of the legislative rulings, they fall within our capability. Right? Allah does not put, put upon a person a burden more than they can bear. So Islam is a religion of ease in that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all, all of his legislations are within our capability. Uh, and Allah says another verse, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wants for you ease, and He does not want for you difficulty. Alright, some examples of ease in the religion. Anybody have an example of how Allah makes the religion easy? Yes. Good. 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 So when you're traveling, you can shorten the prayer. You can combine the prayer. You don't have to fast. All right. So this is an example of ease in the religion. Yeah. Okay. Right. Exception. So if a person was fasting uh, and they are <clears throat> old or weak or they're traveling or they're sick, they don't have to fast and they can make it up afterwards. All right. What else? Okay. Right, combining and shortening when you're traveling. Anything else? Yeah. Exactly, right? If you cannot pray standing. Rasulullah says in the hadith, Pray, say standing. If you're not able to pray standing, then pray sitting. If you're not able to pray sitting, then pray on your side. And if you're not able to pray on your side, then pray lying down, reclining. All right, so if a person is not able to uh, carry out any of the commands, then the rulings of ease apply. Right, anything else? Good. So uh, if you are not able to make wudu with water, you have a skin condition, you have a sickness ailment, you can make tayammum. Right, you can make tayammum. Anything else? Yeah. Good. Excellent. Right. So. Uh, this is regarding removing munkar. Man yara minkum munkaran fal yugayiruhu biyadi. Rasulullah says, whoever sees an evil, then let him remove it with his hand. And if he's not able to remove it with his hand, then fabi lisani, with his tongue. If he's not able to remove it with his tongue, fabi qalbihi. And then you can do it, with, uh, then you at least hate it in your heart. وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ الْإِيمَانِ Rasulullah said that's the lowest level of iman. Yeah. Very good, exactly. Um, and this is in the Quran, alright? Fala adin fala isma Allah talks about the verses, the verse talks about what you're not allowed to eat. Right? You cannot eat uh, carrion, you cannot eat uh, the flesh of pig. And then at the end of the verse, Allah says, Whoever is in a state of compulsion, alright, a state of necessity, <coughs> then you can you can eat these things that are prohibited. Alright? And this is a matter of ease. Alright, so there are, there are a number of numerous examples, right, of this, of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the religion easy and has not put difficulty on it, meaning that we all of the rulings of Islam are within our capability. There's nothing that Allah has commanded us with that we are not able to do for normal human beings, right? And sometimes the exceptions might occur when a person might be in a situation where they're not able to, and then the rulings will come and be adjusted for that person. Right? As we said that when it comes to the salah, a person can't pray. Standing, you have to pray standing, right? This is a pillar of the salah, as we will see later on, right? You, you're not, you don't have a choice to pray sitting, but if you can't pray standing, then you pray sitting. And if you can't pray sitting, then go down to the next level. So uh, for a normal person, all of the commands and all the prohibitions are within our capabilities. Uh, as we gave examples here, right? One cannot pray, uh, one can pray sitting if it's difficult to stand. Uh, shortening, combining the prayers when you're traveling. Uh, these are two examples, and we gave a few more after that. All right, the sources of uh, Islamic fiqh. Where do we derive 
uh, all of these rulings from. This is wajib. This is, uh, this is haram. This is recommended. Where do we derive the rulings of uh, Islamic legislation from? There are uh, four main sources of Islamic legislation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, so these are the four agreed upon sources of Islamic legislation. All right, and they are the primary sources of Islamic legislation. The first is the Quran. The second is the Sunnah. The third is Ijma', scholarly consensus. And the fourth is Al Qiyas, which is analogy. All right, these are the four primary sources of Islamic legislation. And uh, these are all agreed upon. There are secondary sources of is Islamic legislation beyond these four. All right? um, and some of them are disagreed over. Anybody have any examples? So we have these four, these are agreed upon. And then you have secondary sources, which uh, are, some of them are disputed, and, and we go to them if we don't find a ruling in the first four. Yeah. Good, right? So the practice of the people of Medina. The people of Medina is what they did, is that a source of Islamic law or not? So for three out of the four madhahib, it is not. All right, but for Imam Malik and the Maliki madhab, they considered this a source of Islamic law. So Imam Malik, he lived in Medina, and his reasoning or his view is that the majority of Sahaba settled in Medina. So if we find the people of Medina practicing Islam a certain way, then they must have gotten it from somewhere. They must have gotten it from the Sahaba. And so this, he would consider this a source of Islamic law. Right? He would consider this a source of Islamic law. All right, any other sources of Islamic law besides the four? Uh, or the one you just mentioned? Okay, so this is called Shar'u Man Qablana. The, 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 the uh, legislation of the previous nations. Is this a legislation for us too? So for example, if we know that Allah mandated such and such for Bani Israel. Does this apply for the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi as well or not? All right, so this is a disputed, this is a disputed source of Islamic law. Whether the legislation for the people before us is that legislation for us or not. All right, um, and there are a few others. Uh, anybody else have any, anything else? There's something called Saddu Dhariya, which is uh, preventing the means uh, of, uh, preventing the means of something, uh, uh, preventing the means of something. All right, so for example, um, there is a um, there is a, a situation where uh, if we give an example, a practical example, uh, putting a, like a, say, a, say a barrier in the masjid, right, to separate men and women, right. Uh, this would be called sadu dariya, right, preventing the means of from from evil from happening, right. So this in itself, right, it's not. Uh, it's not a ruling in itself, but it's preventing something that is a, a something desired in the Sharia, which is preventing mixing men and women, right? So the, the barriers or the different sections of the masjid, all right, or, 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 or whatever the case is, this would become something called saddu dhariya, which is um, preventing the, the, the evil before it happens, taking the means to prevent the evil before it happens. Right, and there are a number of examples of that as well. Is this a source of legislation or not? This, right, this is also secondary source of legislation. All right, uh, so there are num numerous other ones. Um, and these are discussed in the books of what we call Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh dis discusses this. There's the secondary uh, sources of Islamic legislation. But as far as we're concerned right now, we're focusing on the first four. These are agreed upon. The Quran, the Sunnah, consensus, ijma', and analogy, al-Qiyas. So the first, of course, is the Quran. Right, the first source of Islamic legislation is the Quran. Anything, any question that we have, any ruling that we, that we want to know the ruling of, uh, any issue that we need to know the ruling of, we first go to the Quran. Right, the Quran is the primary source. We find the ruling, then the Quran trumps everything else. If we don't find the ruling, then we'll go to the secondary sources. All right, but the Quran is the primary sources and reference for rulings of Islamic fiqh. Right, if we want to know the ruling of anything, we'll first consult and go to the Qur'an, and then afterwards, anything else after. Uh, so for example, if we want to know what the ruling is on wine and gambling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us what that ruling is. Ya ayyuhal ladheena aminu, innam al-khamru wal-maysiru wal-ansab wal-azlam murijasun min a'amil shaytan fajtanibuhu la'alakum tuflihun. Allah says in the Qur'an, O you who believe wine and gambling, stone altars and divining arrows 
are filth from the handiwork of shaitan, avoid them completely so that you may perhaps be successful. All right, if you want to know the ruling, what is the ruling of buying and selling trade? All right, are we allowed to uh, buy and sell? Allah has says in the Quran, Allah has uh, declared trade lawful. What is the ruling of interest? Riba. riba. So these are all clearly spelled out in the Quran that Allah has allowed trade and He has declared usury, riba, unlawful. All right, if we want to know the. yeah. Right, right. The, right, yeah. Right, that would be something else, all right? Uh, if it has a specific meaning in that time, and now you have uh, something else that is similar to it, that would be the qiyas, analogy, all right? That would be the, the, the fourth source. So you incorporate that, you wouldn't just take the verse. Well, you use the verse as a primary means, right? But we're talking about things that are in the Quran, right? If you're, you're talking about something that didn't exist, another type of wine, then, then that's not necessarily, uh, that, that would be qiyas, that would be the analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, of course, yeah. Uh, if we were to ask, uh, what about what is the ruling of hijab? Allah has also mentioned that in the Quran. Wala yubdina zinatuhunna illa ma zahra minha. Allah says about uh, to the believing women, or about the believing women, that they should not display their adornments except what normally shows. Wal yadrubna bi khumurihin ala juubihin, and they should draw their head coverings, the uh, the khumur, which is the head coverings, the plural khimar, or the plural for khimar, and cross their their chest or their breast and cover that. Uh, Another verse on hijab, Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'mineen yudilina alayhin min jalabi bihin. Dalika adna an yu'rafna fala yu'dayn wa kana allahu ghafoorur rahimah. O Prophet, tell your wives and daughters and the women of the believers to draw their outer garments, jalabib. Their outer garments closely around themselves. This makes it more likely that they will be recognized and not be harmed. And Allah is ever forgiving and most merciful. So, right, so all these are rulings that are found in the Quran. All right, so if you want to know what is the ruling of hijab? Hijab is in the Quran. All right, what is the ruling of wine, gambling? It is in the Quran. What is the ruling on fasting? It is in the Quran. All right, so these rulings are in the Quran. And this is the primary uh, source for Islamic legislation. Now the Quran though, and this is the point that you mentioned earlier, which is the Quran doesn't always necessarily give details. Right? It doesn't give details. So Allah, Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us to the Quran to pray. وَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ but Allah does not spell out in detail how to pray, right? Uh, how many rakats are there in Dhuhr? How many rakats are there in Maghrib, Isha? Is that in the Quran? It's not, right? So the, the Quran does not say how, how many rakats are in each salah, right? Or what to say in this position, what to say in that position. So the Quran uh, is, sometimes, is oftentimes uh, very general. So this is where the Sunnah would come in. The Sunnah of Rasulullah will come in and explain the Quran and give the details with that. All right, the Quran is very detailed when it comes to theology. All right, Allah is very detailed in the Quran with, when it comes to theology. When it comes to worship transactions, then it's a lot more general. When, right, when it comes to zakat, uh, when it comes to fasting, the, the, the rules of fasting, they're very general in the Quran and the Sunnah is what uh, gives more details regarding that. All right, so as we said, uh, the Quran commands us to pray, but it does not, it does not say how many units for each prayer. Uh, Allah commands us to give zakat. وَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةِ Give the zakat. Uh, but it does not say how much zakat to give. All right, or what type of wealth do you have to pay zakat on? All right, it does give, it does give the recipients of zakat. Allah does mention who is eligible to receive the zakat, but He does not say what type of wealth do you pay zakat on. All that is found uh, in the sunnah. Right, Allah orders us to fulfill our contracts. Fulfill your contracts. But it does not talk about what kind of contracts are valid, what kind of contracts are invalid. Right, all these are found in the secondary uh, sources of Islamic legislation. All right, and this is why the Quran and Sunnah go hand in hand. Right? The Quran and Sunnah go hand in hand. Uh, what is the, before we talk about the Sunnah, uh, what is the definition of Sunnah? Anyone? Yes. Yes. Oh, 
Okay, good. So the third or fourth thing is pretty much the same, right? Well, yeah. ما نقل عن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ما نقل عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من قول أو فعل أو تقرير whatever has been has come to us has been transmitted to us from speech from the process of sayings or his actions or his approvals his sayings his actions or approvals this is سنة right this is سنة what has been transmitted to us from the sayings of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم or has been translated from from his actions or his approvals Sayings, example of that, anyone? Example of a saying of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's many, yes. Okay. Good. Kul bi aminik, which means eat with your right hand. Alright, what else? Hmm? Okay. A dua mukhlu ibadah. The dua is the, the not weapon, uh, what is mukh? Brain, like the brain. Yeah. Muk means like the, your brain. The essence. Meaning that means the essence of ibadah. All right. Anything else? Any other? Adinun nasiha. And there's so many, right? There's, uh, there's, uh, we, we, won't, we won't run out of examples of uh, hadith uh, that are dealing with the, the statements of Rasulullah. What about actions? Actions. Example of action. Yeah. Good. All right, good. So coming to the masjid, taking off his shoes. Anything else? Action, example of action. Good, he did tawaf on a camel. Good, what is the ruling of doing tawaf on a camel? Yeah. Or a wheelchair or a um, electric scooter. All right. This is a, sec a secondary topic. But uh, the right, this is an example of action. All right, what about approval? Approval of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He gives approval to something. Okay. Okay. So the Abyssinians who came and they, they performed uh, in the masjid. And he watched it and he approved it and he didn't say anything. All right. So this is also a source of legislation. So whatever Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says is a source of legislation. Whatever he does is a source of legislation. Whatever he approves of, even if he doesn't do it himself, if he sees it happening in front of him, and he approves it, then this is also source of legislation. All right. Um, so, as we said, right, the Sunnah is what has been transmitted from the Prophet in terms of words, actions, affirmations. Example of words: uh, the Hadith in Bukhari, insulting a Muslim is iniquity or fisk. Sibab al Muslim fisk. Right, Rasulullah says that uh, insulting or cursing a Muslim, this is uh, fisk, this is disobedience. Uh, and وَقِتَالُهُ kufr, And killing a Muslim is disbelief. Killing him is disbelief. Uh, example of actions. Hadith in Bukhari from Aisha radiallahu anha. Uh, when she was asked, what would the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam do in his house? She said, he was in the service of his family. And when it was time to pray, he prayed. So this is an example of action. How did he, uh, what, what did he do at home? What was the Rasulullah SAW doing in, in his house? She said that he was in the service of his family. Uh, example of affirmation. This hadith is by, uh, related by Abu Dawood in which the Prophet SAW saw a man praying two units after dawn, after the dawn prayer. So he said to him, the dawn prayer is two units. So this, this man is praying. So we know that there is a sunnah right before Fajr. There is no sunnah after Fajr. There's no sunnah after Fajr. So the Rasulullah sees this man, he's praying two sunnah after Fajr. So he tells him, maybe the man didn't know that Fajr is only two. Why are you, you know, why are you adding to it? So the man said, I did not pray the two units that are performed before. So I'm praying them now. All right, I'm praying them now. The Prophet ﷺ was then quiet. He didn't say that this is invalid. So this is approval. All right, he, he, he heard the man's answer and he was silent, meaning that he approved of what the man did. So this is a proof and evidence that if you miss the sunnah before Fajr, you can pray it after. Because there is a general prohibition though that uh, after you uh, pray the Fajr, you should not pray anything else afterwards until, uh, until after sunrise, right? There's a general prohibition of that. 
But this is an example where a person can still pray. If you miss the, the two rakats before Fajr, you can pray them afterwards. Right? And Rasul Sam saw this and he approved of it when he heard uh, the man give his answer. Alright, so these are all examples of uh, either words, uh, words from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, statements, uh, actions, or approvals. Yes. Is it the same thing he did with the two rakats before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yes. So the question is on the two rakats before Maghrib. The two rakats before Maghrib, which is which happens in some of the masajid. Uh, so Rasulullah himself did not used to normally perform this salah. Right? The two rakats before Maghrib. But he did uh, he did allow it. In fact, there's a hadith, he says, Sallu qabl al-maghrib, he said it three times, Sallu qabl al-maghrib, Sallu qabl al-maghrib, liman sha, whoever wants to. All right, so he did, uh, he did order it, this is, this is also an example of uh, sunnah by speech, by, by statements, even though he did not do it himself. And he saw uh, this becomes legislated, All right, this becomes a source of legislation. And there's also a general hadith, which is that uh, there's a sunnah between, and there's sunnah between adhan, uh, iqam, adhan and iqama. All right, there's a sunnah between adhan and iqama. Uh, any, any, between any adhan and any qama, there is legislation of sunnah. So even if he did not do this, uh, it is established by his speech and it is established by his approval. All right, so we have examples here, of, and there's numerous examples of Rasulullah's statements, his actions, and his approvals. All right, the, the sunnah's rank. Uh, now what is the purpose uh, of the sunnah? What is the purpose of the sunnah? What is the function of the sunnah? Good. Good. So the sunnah, it explains the Qur'an. All right, does the sunnah have any other function besides that? Any other function? Is, is that the only role of the sunnah? Okay. When it comes to legislation, specifically legislation, as it relates to Islamic legislation, the sunnah, all right, it explains the Qur'an. Is that it? Is that the only role of the sunnah when it comes in... in, in in relation to Islamic legislation? Good, all right, so, so this brings us another point. Can the Sunnah also uh, come up with independent rule, rulings? Can Rasulullah legislate? Or does it only, legislation only comes from the Quran? Right, this is what you're saying, right? The, uh, just, just what you're saying that the, like the, the Rasulullah some orders something, and it's not in the Quran, or do we still have to follow it? Right. So and good. So this is another role of the Sunnah. So the Sunnah explains the Quran, but the Sunnah can also come with independent legislation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Good, yeah. So the, the sunnah has basically three main uh, functions, right? Number one, it confirms the Qur'an. The sunnah confirms the Qur'an. Right, so uh, Allah says in the Qur'an, وَقِيمُ الصَّلَىٰ And then we have the hadith, بُنْيَ الْإِسْلَامُ عَلَىٰ خَمْسِ شَهَادَةِ إِلَّا إِلَىٰ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَىٰ Right, so Allah says in the Qur'an, He mentions salah. And then in the sunnah, in the hadith, the Rasulullah mentions salah. So the, the sunnah confirms what is in the Qur'an. Right, the sunnah also explains. Number two, the sunnah explains the Qur'an. So coming back to the example of the salah, Allah orders us to pray, but He does not tell us how many rakats to make each prayer. He does not tell us how to, with the order of each position, you start from the standing position, then you go into the bound position, then you come back up. None of that is in the Qur'an. Right? So the sunnah explains the Qur'an. So the sunnah confirms the Qur'an, it explains the Qur'an, and it can also be an independent source of legislation. In other words, there are rulings that are not found in the Qur'an, but it's found only in the Sunnah. Examples. Anybody have an example? This is something that only found in the Sunnah, the Qur'an does not mention this. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, good. All right, is there any verse in the Quran about the beard? Nothing, right? There's good, but is that is that uh, that, that's not there's no evidence or proof in that from that, right? He thought he, the brother mentioned about Musa grabbing the, the beard of Harun. Okay, uh, but is, is there a command in that or anything to indicate that it's praiseworthy? Not necessarily. All right, so all right, the beard. Anything else? We saw hijab. Hijab is in the Quran, right? We give, we get the verse of hijab. Anything else? Okay, good. All right, the, the manners of using the bathroom. All right, or for example, uh, what is the ruling of men wearing gold? Right, that's not in the Quran. Right, or men wearing silk. It's not in the Quran. All right, but uh, Rasulullah has given that order, and so it becomes binding, and it becomes a source of legislation. All right, so uh, the Sunnah has that function. It clarifies the Quran, uh, explains the Quran, and it could also, we can also find uh, independent rules from the uh, Quran, as we said, right? The wearing gold or silk. All right, then after that, we have consensus. And uh, yes. Yes. Good. So the brother is asking about uh, the verse in the Surah Al-Najm, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ Where Allah says that he, referring to Rasulullah Sallam, does not speak out of his desire. All right? And uh, does that refer only legislation or is it in general? And uh, the answer is in general. All of his, anything Rasulullah Sallam does is an example for us. And anything he says is, uh, is legislation for us in that sense. All right? Uh, there was a... Um, one of the companions, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he used to write down, right? He used to write down the, the hadith of Rasulullah And uh, people came to him and they said, why are you writing down everything he's, he's doing? You know, sometimes he might, he might get angry. He might, uh, you know, he, he might not intend for something to be written down. So they, they, they told him, you know, why are you writing everything, everything down? And uh, so uh, at that point, the, the companion, Abdullah ibn Amr, he, he actually stopped writing down. He stopped writing down the hadith. And then later on, he went to Rasulullah and he told them, he told Rasulullah what the people are saying. That, you know, they're, they're saying, you shouldn't write down everything that, that you're saying because sometimes you speak and you might be angry or you might, you know, be in a state of happiness or something. And Rasulullah told him, Uktub, write. فَمَا يَخُجُ مِنْ And he pointed his, his mouth. فَمَا يَخُجُ مِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا الْحَقِّ That nothing comes out of here except for the truth. So everything Rasulullah anything he says, Right, it becomes uh, automatically becomes a source of legislation, right? So this uh, and anything he says uh, is a source of legislation and is uh, is divine in a, in, a, in a way that he's not saying it from his own desires. He doesn't say anything from his own desires. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. So, okay, so he's, the verse is asking about the, the verse in the Quran وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُدُهُ Whatever the messenger gives you, take it وَمَا نَهَكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever he prohibits you, then stay away from it this, this, the, That verse is, is also it's a proof uh, for the independent legislation of the Sunnah That Rasulullah has that uh, authority to legislate Meaning that we can derive rulings from his statements or his actions. Right? If Rasulullah says that this is allowed, it's allowed. If he says this is mandatory, it's mandatory. If he says this is prohibited, it's prohibited. And this is from the Quran itself. This is from the Quran itself. And there's a, there's a, it was an incident, uh, I believe it's uh, with uh, Abdullah bin Abbas, where there was a particular ruling. Right? There was a particular ruling. And uh, this ruling is not found in the Quran. Uh, right, it's not found in the Quran, it's found in the Hadith, it's found in the Sunnah. And a woman came to him and she says that, you know, I don't find this in the Quran. Right, this particular ruling, I don't find it in the Quran. So he told her, go back and read it again, go read the Quran again. Right, and she read it again and she still didn't find this ruling, it's not in the Quran. Uh, so she came back to him again and she said, I don't find this ruling in the Quran, where, you know, why, why should we follow it? It's not in the Quran. 
And uh, he said, did you not read the verse where Allah says, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُهُ Did you not read the verse where Allah says, whatever the messenger gives you, take it. Right? Whatever the messenger gives you, then you have to take it. Right? So he's, basic, uh, the, he's basically referring to the fact that the Qur'an itself uh, tells us that Rasulullah is a source of legislation. That he is a source of legislation and we can derive rulings from independently from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course not. Right, this is, uh, yeah, right, but this, that wasn't a command, right? It wasn't a command. The verse is regarding what, what, what he commands you with, you have to follow it, right? If, Allah, if Rasulullah Islam commands you with something, then we have to follow it, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alright, so the question is, <clears throat> does the, uh, uh, this apply to the Khulafa as well? Based on the, uh, the hadith, Alaykum is Sunnati wa Sunnat al Khulafa al Rashidin al Mahdiin. Rasulullah Sallam says that follow my Sunnah and the Sunnah of the rightly guided Khulafa after me. So, are they also sources of legislation? Is the question, right? Not independently. Not independently. They have to, anything they do must go back to the Quran and Sunnah as well. Right? Anything they do must go back to the Quran and Sunnah. So they're not a source of independent legislation. Right? Umar radiallahu anhu or Abu Bakr, they cannot make up anything. And uh, we use that hadith to, to say that uh, we can follow them. And of course, they never did this to begin with. There's, this is hypothetical, because right? they didn't make up anything. Uh, even that example you gave about the taraweeh, it's, this is based on understanding that these are, this is allowed for that number, right? Not that they, he, he made it up on his own, right? So uh, anybody else after Rasulullah is not, they're not an independent source of legislation. They go, they have to go back to uh, the Quran and the, the Sunnah of the Hadith. That was the, the, the same answer. The Prophet's family is source of law, they will go back to uh, the same thing. No, no one else is an independent source of legislation besides Allah and His Messenger. Right? Everybody else has to go back to those two. All right, but so the hadith about leaving, uh, I'm leaving you your, your, the book and your, and your family, this, this is not talking about legislation. It's talking about following them in, in terms of they are following the messenger, so you follow them because they're following the messenger, not because they can independently make up the religion on their own. All right? All right, any, any questions? I think we'll, we'll pause here for today, up to, up to there. And then uh, next time we will uh, go, go over the remaining sources of legislation, consensus and uh, al-qiyas. And then after that, uh, there will be some Islamic terms, terminology, right? Uh, what is the meaning of farad, wajib, uh, farad, aini, and so on, right? Uh, so this, that will come up in the next session, inshallah. Um, next week, we're going to be off, right? We'll take it next week off because next week is a holiday weekend. It's a long weekend. A lot of people are traveling. So we'll skip next week's session and we'll resume the following week. We'll resume the following week, inshallah. So next week, no class next week. All right, any, any questions before we end? Yes. We have, say that. Okay. Mm -hmm.
So the brother's asking about the banking system. That's a complicated question. <laughs> that, that will require uh, knowledge of uh, dividends. Anybody who's financial experts here to tell the difference between? Obviously, we know that the banking system, it, it, it depends on interest. The modern banking system is all revolving around interest. All right? No doubt about that. But uh, the fact that it revolves or depending on interest doesn't necessarily mean that everything dealing with the bank is necessarily haram, right? Opening an account with the bank does not necessarily mean that you can't open an account with the bank, all right? Uh, but anything that in, in which you are dealing with the, directly with the interest, then that would fall under prohibition. Okay, yes. So they're not the same. Yes, they're not the same. Okay. Right? So you, 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 you would have to consult right, uh, somebody, an expert in that, to, to know what the difference is the two, between the two. Inshallah. So just to get back to the topic here. Um, uh, they want snack. All right, what you're asking is an entire lecture. <laughs> There's no way we're going to be able to answer that now. So that will be, that will be inshallah, will come later on, but the, that's, that's not a one-minute answer. That's not a one-minute yeah, answer. Science. Yeah, of course, there's a science, yes. And that's, that's really not, we're not really concerned about that at this point. That's something you study in a field called usul al-fiqh, how to derive the rulings from the sources. All right? And that's, so that's, the, that's the function of the one who has reached the level of uh, of having the ability to do so, right? The mujtahid, the one who is, has reached a level of ijtihad, then they're the ones who are able to derive the, the rulings from the sources, right? Uh, but that, of course, yeah, yeah, that, and yeah. That's that's studied in the, that's a complete. That's not fit actually. That's a different topic of uh, sub sub uh, sub field. All right, so we'll, we'll close here for today. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallah bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. There's uh, refreshments at the back uh, for everyone, inshallah.